everybody, welcome back to another video. And this is gonna be the first video in a series about how to build your own rolling island for your barbecue area. As you probably know, if you've watched our channel, we have a Pit Boss um, combo pellet smoker and gas grill. We also have our Blackstone griddle. And we have them out on the back patio. We move them around to where we need them. But there's always a lack of um, prep area, if you will. And we've really been wanting to build sort of an outdoor kitchen. But instead of doing something permanent, we wanted something that had all of the flexibility that we might desire for what we're doing today or if we want something a little bit different. So with that, I'm actually gonna be building a 24 inch by 48 inch rolling island that's gonna be about 40 inches tall. Now your typical countertop is about 35 in your house. Um, we wanted to be a little taller, mainly just because it's a comfortable height for doing you know, prep work, et cetera. So that's what we're doing. And I'm gonna show you a pretty simple way to do this. Not gonna be real complex. I'm basically using all just things you can buy at your local, you know, Home Depot or Lowe's or you know, Home Center. Um, it's primarily gonna be made from two by fours, uh, pretty simple construction, and it's gonna have rolling casters on the bottom so that we can roll it around and lock those wheels wherever we want it. Uh, and we're gonna be making it out of something that is perfectly fine to stay outside and withstand the weather. So as I mentioned before, we're gonna do it in two by four, but we're going to make that waterproof. We'll show you how we do that at the end. And we're also going to um, do the siding of it Using um, a cement board, I think James Hardy, Hardy Plank is one of them. Our home is stucco on the outside and we want it to look like that. So we're going to do it in a material that's gonna be really strong, made out of that concrete, waterproof, and have a similar look to the house. So when we're not using it, we slide it right up against the back of the house and next to the grills, it will blend right in and, and look um, sort of aesthetically pleasing for anybody going down the road or the canal where we live. And then I'll also show you the plans in some more detail. So um, I've been thinking about this for a few weeks, kind of on and off. Went ahead and got some graph paper, graphed it all out. Got my material list right here. Let's get started. By the way, if you do enjoy this content, I'd ask you just take a minute, do me a favor, go to down and, and like the video or subscribe to it, share it with other people that you know that are doing barbecuing and they fi might find this uh, useful for their home as well. Hope you guys enjoy this. Okay, let's start with the plans. And again, we have a 24 by 48 inch countertop. And you can see it's gonna have about a two inch overhang around all four sides so that my counter and uh, has a lip on it. It's exactly what we wanna have happen. And you'll notice that there's going to be made a two by four. So this is gonna be a whole two by four frame, which I'll show you in a minute. But when looking down, we're gonna make corners where we're gonna attach two two by fours in an L-shaped configuration like that. So this is kind of a top view of these corner brackets. So let me show you what that actually is going to look like. So this is our um, sort of front view, if you will, the length view. And as I mentioned before, these are actually gonna be two two by fours in an L-shaped configuration. So we're gonna need eight of these two by fours cut at 33 inches long. And again, the reason we need eight is there's going to be two on each corner with the four corners of the cart. So we're gonna need two of those. We're gonna need two pieces that are cut 37 inches long because we're gonna essentially make the, we're gonna attach those to the inside of these with some pocket screws. So we're gonna need um, four of those, so two for the front side, two for the back side. And then we're gonna need two pieces that are 44 inches long. 44 inches are gonna sit on top of these L-shaped corner brackets, and that's gonna build the frame side um, of our, of our um, cart itself. And again, we have 33 inches tall, plus our two by fours on the side on each side, right? That gives us another three inches. That makes that 36 inches of cabinet plus a four inch wheel is what's gonna bring us up to 40 inches tall. You could be 41 to 41 and a half, depending on the thickness countertop you put on. If you do granite on top of it, whatever thickness you buy is gonna apply there. A butcher block might be an inch and a half, right? You, you decide on what you're gonna put on top of this. I'm gonna show you just the frame section because you have a lot of choices in the next portion. Now let's look specifically at the side view, right? So this is the length view. Uh, again, we're 44 inches long because the whole cart's gonna be 48. So the countertop's 48 and it gives me a two inch overhang on each side. So 44 inches long there. And then this one here is going to be 20 inches long. And same reason, we want a two inch overhang on each side. So it's gonna be 24 wide. And this is very similar. So what we're looking at here is the side view of the top that you just saw. This is gonna be the edge of that two by four, another two by four there. That's that corner piece we talked about. We're going to put um, some horizontal brackets using pocket screws across here. Just so we'll need four of these pieces at 10 inches and we're gonna need four of them at 20 inches. So there we go, that's our setup. Over here, yeah, right here. 
Hey, do me a favor. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more like it, subscribe to the channel and click on that little bell notification so you get notified of new videos. Thanks. Okay, so I have all my 33 inch pieces here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna assemble these into these L-shaped pieces, which will become our corner supports for our uh, cabinet. Um, you can easily do these just where you lay this on top and, and do a, a sort of a butt joint, if you will. Um, you know, countersink some holes and just run screws through it. Remember, we're gonna have siding on the outside of this, so it is really pretty easy. I'm actually using pocket holes. Um, I drilled some pocket hole screws here, and I'll be assembling these this way. I will be gluing and screwing them just for a little bit of extra support. But again, you don't have to do it that way. Really, it's whatever, whatever you want, and this gave me a good excuse to go buy a pocket hole jig. So now it's just a matter of gluing and screwing these pieces together. As I mentioned before, I'm actually using a pocket hole jig, uh, which is really kind of nice. You can buy them as cheap as 30 bucks, or you can get um, a sort of nicer one for about 120 or so on Amazon. This is what one side is going to look like. So we'll have a piece of wood that needs to go here. We'll pocket jig it in there, and then we're going to put a piece on the end that holds it all together. That'll keep it good and square. And now I'm just putting the holes in the four brackets here. That's the top and bottom for both the front and back. This is the nicer jig I mentioned. Okay, for this section, you definitely want to do this somewhere that you know is going to be level. So I'm doing it on the garage floor. So again, I'm gluing and screwing this. So I'm applying glue where I know the pieces are going to go ahead and make contact. And then I'm just going to align them with a square. And I'm starting with just one screw on each side just to get it tacked into place. And I'm going to go ahead and put all of the rest of the screws in forming one good front or back piece. Then it's a matter of rinse and repeat. We're just gonna go ahead and build the other side. Again, the front and the back are identical, so it doesn't matter which you start with here. So just like the tops and bottoms we had for the front and back, we need to do the same for the sides. And you see me pocket drilling them right there with the jig. And then it's a matter of doing the exact same thing you did before. This is good to have a friend with, hold up the pieces. At that point, you're going to very carefully rotate it around and put it on the other side since it's not yet held together. You can see we worked together to do this. And then once flipped over, we just repeated the exact same process. We now have a full squared frame. And you notice we're checking it for square and level as we assemble this, just to be sure. So this is upside down. I'll end up putting the pocket screws through here to create this sort of frame and then screw that onto the bottom and the top. And once I do, the wheels will mount here, we'll flip it over, and we have our countertop. So you can kind of see the height here, it's at about hip height, but it's gonna be seven inches. It'll be seven inches taller than this by the time I add the two by four frame on the top and the bottom, plus the wheels, which are three and three quarters of an inch high. So what you're looking at in front of you is the frame itself. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put some caps on this. That's one of the things we're gonna do today. We'll add the casters and we'll start to put our siding on this. And we're gonna be using a, um, a cement infused siding. Uh, you might have heard it as a hardy siding or hardy plank. Um, I think that's one of the brand names, at least here in the US that is used. But it is a, um, a very solid, very heavy, very waterproof. And frankly, it's gonna aesthetically look and match our house. So it's gonna look like it blends in. Um, the nice thing about it is they have one that has a pre-printed pre pattern of stucco right on it. So that saves me a lot of time and helps reduce me needing the stucco over this thing. I put most of these frames together using pocket screws. Uh, that is definitely the way to go. I have never used pocket screws before this project and I have been missing out. They are phenomenal. Um, simple, easy to use. You can glue and screw them very easily. Uh, I clamped them just long enough to hold them in place. Once you screw them, you can take the clamps out and move on to the next piece. You don't have a lot of work sitting around waiting for the glue to dry. So I am going to start by getting this thing screwed in here. Actually, I gotta set it on something level. Doing, doing a little angled piece here. but. Uh, the purpose of this is really added strength. What this is gonna do is create the bottom base, and then I've got this upside down. I'll mount my casters right here, flip it over, put the top one on, and then we're gonna side the whole thing. I went ahead and ordered two stainless steel doors and frames as well, so I can open this thing up and keep all kinds of storage inside of it. 
Okay, to go ahead and screw this in, I've just clamped it down. Everything's held in place. I made sure it was right. The nice thing by using the clamps is you can hold it all in place and use a mallet and just tap it a little bit if you have to just get it perfectly aligned. And that's exactly what I did here. Now I'm using a good exterior grade screw here. It's exactly what we're gonna certainly make sure we do. I'm using two and a half inch ones. I figure that gives me a good inch bite into the next piece of wood. Plus I'm gonna countersink it just a little bit just for the sheer force and soft pine wood. So I should get, you know, at least an inch and a quarter. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna do one on each corner and one in the center here as well. So I need six of these guys. And the nice thing is <laughs> I buy these good exterior ones. If you use a good high powered um, cordless drill, you can run them right in with enough power to just countersink them down below. Most of those electric uh, cordless drills have a clutch on them. I have mine set to eight and that should be enough to just drive it below the surface but not pull it way in there. <laughs> And now it's time to go ahead and drill the pilot holes for each of the casters. And I'm doing this because I just don't want to risk the actual 2x4 splitting, given that I'm going to have four screws in each caster. Okay, with our pilot holes drilled, we're now just going to go ahead and get these lined up, and we'll start putting the screws in. All right, moment of truth, let's flip this guy over. And you get a sense of just how high this counter is going to be. So it's going to be nice and high. I think it's going to be a good working height. Just like before, with this top on and clamped in place, it's now a matter of putting our six screws down into the top of it to hold it down. Hopefully my um, my doors will get here soon. I'm going to cut two of the two by fours to the right length to go ahead and pocket screw them in. I won't attach them yet, but I can get them cut and the pocket holes drilled. So 26 inches in height will be perfect to fit between the lower support and the upper support. And I'll attach those with pocket screws. That'll make the outside edges of the frame for where the door panel will go on. That'll be nice because once it fits in there nice and tight, then I can actually run screws through the stainless steel door frame into, the, uh, into those pocket beams I'm putting up. All right, we'll just cut the next one. Hey, while I'm cutting this wood right quick, I'd love for you to go ahead and like the video and go ahead and subscribe. Share a comment down below. Thanks. I figure you guys might enjoy a little bit of a behind the scenes look. So every once in a while I will film out in the garage. That's what the green screen's there for. Um, I am going to attempt to cut this piece of hardy plank out here in the garage. I've got a pretty flimsy table here, but I have this board set up to hold it, the saw in the right spot. We're gonna give it a shot, see what happens. Um, I don't mean something dangerous, I just mean, yeah, you can see how flimsy this is, the way I have it set up. I need to move everything, this stuff's heavy, I'm gonna cut it, that'll reduce 25% of the weight right there. All right. Oh, and by the way, and I'm really not sure that this blade is the right one for this, so that's the other part of this. I know, I should be wearing safety goggles. You know, get mad at me. Yeah, Some nasty dust comes off of this stuff. Well, it's lighter. Now I can at least cut the rest in the garage, so, or outside the garage. I don't want to get all that cement dust all over there. All right, so I did the majority of this off camera. This fiberboard stuff just gets dust everywhere. My glasses are covered in it. I'm gonna go in, hop in, take a quick shower, rinse this stuff off me. Um, if you're gonna cut much of this stuff, definitely wear eye protection, definitely wear a respirator. It, it's really kind of gross. It's like if you've ever used a bag of concrete and you dump out the stuff, that cloud that first comes up, it's like that, but it's everywhere. I just took a air hose and, and blew off the saw. It was just covered in that too. So anyway, I have my four sides cut. Um, I'm going to wait when I get the frame in for the aluminum or the stainless doors today. That will um, allow me to drill a few holes in this and cut the opening. I want it to be one full sheet other than that. I'm going to use a jigsaw with that. I'm going to do it out here. So hopefully it doesn't make quite as much of a mess. Um, 
And yeah, we've got our rolling rack here ready. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rinse off, clean up, and then I'm gonna cover this with epoxy. So that'll be the next step. Let's get the frame waterproofed. Again, it's gonna have siding and paint on it, and I don't think it's gonna get wet inside, but I intend to keep uh, supplies in here. So I certainly wanna make sure that it stays dry, and God forbid if it does get wet, I don't want this rotting away. All right, so our doors came in, which means we can now start to put our frame down the sides where it's going to hold it in. Let's open this thing up and take a look at these. All right, these look pretty nice. So with these uh, boards in there, we now have the support we need to stand this up right there. Now, that's the way it'll sit in there. Obviously, there's going to be siding over this, so it looks really nice and right on the outside of it. This will just... <laughs> I need to make sure I put these on upright. That would be a real big mistake on my part. We're not gonna have to cut a hole in the siding that's gonna go on that side of it. So let's start by getting my measurement here. With the measurements known, it was now just a matter of transferring those measurements down onto the front sheet, drawing a square line around them, and then drilling holes in the four corners, which would allow it to be a little easier to use the jigsaw to cut that particular hole out of it. And again, I wanna do this from one solid piece and make the opening for the doors. In order to mix epoxy, you have to get the ratios just right. The nice thing is West Systems has these pumps and one depression of the pump will disperse uh, the right portion. So one pump of the 105 resin to one pump of the 206 hardener will give me the exact mixture I need. So if I want three times the amount, I pump three of each and I'm all set to go. So let me get these into the containers. All right, got some gloves on though. My hands are a little sweaty. They're not so easy to get on when that happens, but that's all right. And you don't want to use latex gloves with this. You want to use the, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on what they're called, nitrile, N-I-T-R-I-L-E. Nitrile gloves are what you need for this. If you do get any on your hands, acetone cleans it off just fine. All right, I'm gonna start with just taking my hardener here, and I'm gonna pump very slowly until I get all the air out of, the, um, out of this thing itself. And I can start to hear it kind of come up. There we go, we're up already. All right, and I'm just using an old Starbucks cup to get rid of it here. Do the same with the epoxy. All right, we are all set. You wanna have something to mix your epoxy with. I love using little craft sticks or popsicle sticks. They're great for, uh, for doing this. If you can get the wider tongue depressors, it's even better. But I'm not gonna mix up a lot of this because I'm gonna be taking this small brush and I'm gonna go in all of the joints and then I'll use a bigger brush and I can make some um, uh, faster sort of progress. So I'm gonna do three pumps of each here. One, two, three. I'm gonna do the same with the res uh, hardener. One, two, three. And you now wanna mix this for a full minute. When I say a full minute, I don't mean 10, 15 seconds. I mean a full minute. You wanna scrape the sides. You wanna make sure you get it very well incorporated. Okay. <laughs> I'm hiding back behind this thing. Now, remember, epoxy is also an adhesive, so make sure you don't leave this popsicle stick, this stirrer, in a place where you're gonna glue it to something. I don't wanna just set it right up here and have it stick to that. So I'm gonna leave the epoxy side hanging over the edge. And now it's just a matter of painting every single surface, both internally and externally. Make sure you get every crevice. Remember, mix up small batches of epoxy at a time. I was doing batches that were three to five pumps, and that's it. You wanna make sure that you have enough working time before it actually begins to cure. Let me show you a cool little trick, by the way. All right, got my stir sticks and my brush that I won't need anymore. I'm gonna take this, I'm just gonna place it right in my hand like this, pinching at this without touching my skin. I'm gonna reverse this, grabbing that right inside out. Now, we do the same thing with that one, hold it there, and we just go right inside out again, and they're all wet from sweating, but no sticky hands, drop that right in the trash. 
I would go ahead and let this uh, epoxy dry on here. Again, I used the 206 slow hardener. Could take 30, 45 minutes for it to completely dry. It's a little late in the day, so I think I'm gonna call it a day. I'll pick this up again tomorrow. Um, and really, I'm getting close to being done. The next step is to cut the shelf material that I'm gonna put on the very bottom. And I think I'm gonna cut two small one by twos to um, screw on lengthwise and put a second shelf in there so that when I open up those doors, I have storage area. All right, my epoxy is completely dried here, and I also went ahead and cut these uh, pieces of plywood um, for the shelving. Actually, I ended up using boards that were glued together. If I did this again, I would just use plywood. I also painted these with epoxy. I gave it a light sand just to smooth it out a little bit because this is gonna be a shelf inside, and at some point I'm gonna wanna wipe them down, so I want them to be fairly smooth. I'm, I'm not trying to go for a countertop smoothness, but something that has um, filled in all the grain, made this waterproof. I don't anticipate water getting in it, but it'll help protect this whole thing and keep it from uh, rotting, for example. So yeah, looking good, nice and smooth there. You can see the different lighter color where I sanded it a little bit. And I've got two of those, one for the very bottom and then one for the top shelf. I put this little one by two across here. Uh, that's gonna be the support for this shelf. And I'll show you how this goes in here. Put this in here, right in the side. Just drop that in place. And this one, again, I can do it here through the side. And then I just lift it up over this pieces in the front here and set it right on that piece of wood. And I can just screw these down. I actually don't think I'm gonna screw them down. They fit in here tight enough that when I roll it around, it might rattle just a tad, but it'll be very easy if I ever need to get in here and do anything with it. So let's get the hardy plank siding all on this. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about this. We'll get the doors installed right here in this front frame when it's time. What I'm gonna do is do pilot holes through every one that uh, is as wide as the shank, but not the threads of the actual screws I'm using. I'm only using a three quarter inch long screw. It doesn't need to be all that um, long. That gets me through the plank and then twice that length into the actual two by fours behind it. Uh, I'm also gonna countersink them so that they're just below the surface of this. So I found the drill bit size I needed and made sure I knew how well all this drilled. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and start um, pre-drilling all the holes in the countersink spaces. These aren't exactly light, so while I'm holding them up, it'll be easier once everything's ready to go and all I gotta do is put a couple of the screws and attack it in place and then hook the rest up. I think I'm just gonna do six screws on the side panels and we'll see when the big ones in a minute. I'm taking the extra time here to measure the distance from the top and the bottom of each panel and keep them consistent all the way around. I want this to look very pleasing for the eye as well. Once I've had all the pilot holes drilled, it's now time to drill the countersink holes which I'm just doing with a slightly larger bit to get the pan head of the screw just below the surface. With the pilot holes all drilled, it was now time to attach the sides to the frame itself. You may notice I'm using the top center screw as a bit of a pivot point so I can then get it lined up before screwing in the rest of the screws. And now it's just a matter of repeating that same process on all four sides. Okay, so we have our sides on. Everything looks pretty good except for it's really difficult to get these two sides to butt up and create a really nice joint here. And there's a couple things you can do. You can go buy uh, this James Hardy siding stuff at, at your local home supply center, has corner molding. So think of like a one by twos you could put right here, they butt up against one another and it helps hide an, a jagged edge. But because I'm always using epoxy for the boat and whatnot, I'm gonna leverage one of my little boat tricks here. And basically I've taken a small piece of plastic, just a piece of scrap here, and I've cut a rounded edge. So as I scrape this up with an epoxy in here, it's going to create a bullnose right around that edge there. It's exactly what I wanna have happen. And to protect myself from a lot of sanding, I'm gonna put some blue painter's tape right down the side of each of these. So as I scrape that, um, thickened epoxy up, it just pushes right inside of that gap only, and it creates this nice little rounded edge. Now, one of the things I did when I was sanding all this wood and cutting it, I saved a lot of the sawdust. I'm gonna use that to thicken my epoxy. That's gonna one, help it color it, and two, it's gonna get it to a thickness or a consistency kind of like peanut butter. So when I push it into there, it's gonna stay in there. One of the keys to using epoxy is proper surface preparation. And if you get epoxy in a spot where you don't want it, it's not easy to remove. So this blue painter's tape is definitely your friend. And remember, when you mix epoxy, you need to mix it for that full 60 seconds. And in this case, I'm adding a thickener. You don't add the thickener right, right away. You actually mix it for 60 seconds, then you put the thickener or the additive 
and then you mix it in after that. You don't count that time as part of your mix time. There are several methods to apply thickened epoxy. I'm actually just using this small popsicle stick like a putty knife and I'm just scraping it into the actual opening. There's also a method by which you put it into a plastic baggie and you cut the corner of it and you squeeze it out, much like you would if you were decorating icing on a cake. The challenge is, if you're doing a thickened epoxy with um, some kind of large chunks, it can sometimes clog the bag. So in this particular case, I chose to just go ahead and use the little tongue depressors and apply it into all of these openings. I repeated this process on all four corners. Uh, I hate giving times on epoxy because it really depends on the temperature and humidity, but you can see we just peel these off of here. I'm doing this about 15 minutes after I've kind of worked that epoxy all into that crack, and you can sort of see what it looks like here. Actually, I'll zoom in and show you this. A little rough, but it'll look like the stucco, and I give that a little round over with the, um, with the sander. That's going to look good. And you can kind of see this corner. See exactly how that looks? We'll just sand that a little bit before we paint it, round that over, and it's going to look nice and solid all the way down. All right, with all the sides on and my epoxy almost completely cured here, yep, just about cured now. A light sand around this will make it uh, nice and flat, just like the, the front. Um, looks good. And we get a paint over the top of this, this is going to look real nice. I'm really just applying a very light sanding to this with an 80 grit sandpaper and all I'm trying to do is knock down the sharp edges or bumps from the epoxy. Stucco, if you think about how it looks, it kind of looks like concrete put on a surface and then smoothed across the edge. That's exactly what we're doing with the sander here to blend this in. It should blend in very nicely with the stucco siding. And now it's time to dry fit the doors. I'm removing the actual doors off of the frame itself and marking the locations where the screws will go through the stainless steel frame into the wooden frame. Once those are drilled, it's just a matter of putting the doors back on and taking a look at how it fits. This will make it nice and easy to remove later, paint it, and then reattach the doors. Nice and solid. Plenty of room for storage down in here. Top and bottom shelf. Very nice finished look. And I still have this wrapped in plastic right here, but this is gonna be phenomenal. Yeah, this looks good. All right, so one of the last steps we have here is this countertop, and we went back and forth with a lot of different sort of options. Really kind of wanted to do a granite or a corian. I went and checked, and just for a piece of granite that was two feet by four feet that was gonna be cut and polished on the sides, was about $400, <laughs> anywhere from $40 to $60 a square foot. So I already had this piece of wood. I decided to just go ahead and use this. And I just took a, a, a palm sander and I sort of rounded over the edges a little bit and sanded this all down to 220 on the upper side. On the bottom side, I went ahead and just, um, just sanded about the inside four inches or so. Only two inches of this is gonna hang over the sides. So I'm gonna epoxy it all the way around on the bottom, just two to four inches in. I'll leave it plain wood on the inside, which should be just fine. A uh, couple of things I'm gonna use to prepare here. I've got some gloves. I have a heat gun, um, I have my small epoxy tray and epoxy roller. You can't just use a regular paint roller, you have to get one that you, is, you're sure will work with the right chemicals there. Uh, that's what I'm going to use to coat all this. And here's the interesting thing, a heat gun. And what you use the heat gun for is, as you roll the epoxy on, small bubbles will form in the surface. If you take the heat gun and you slowly go over it, you go back and forth, it heats up the epoxy enough for those bubbles to rise to the top and pop. Should give us a smoother surface and reduce the amount of sanding we have to do on the final product. And then I have my epoxy just set up right behind me. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and put this into, I don't know, fast motion or something and get all this done because I'm not gonna wanna touch the camera once I have the gloves on and epoxy all over my hands. So the epoxy process is very similar to what you've seen before. Make sure your surface is prepared, wipe down free of sawdust, mix thoroughly, and then in this case, we're actually applying it with a small roller. This is a four inch wide roller. It's made it a little bit easier to go ahead and apply. Um, you wanna do the bottom side, the edges, and watch for runs because runs in this will thicken and get very hard. So once I've got that first coat on there, I'm now using the heat gun to just go over the surface and hopefully pop any of those bubbles that are right there at the edge. So as this is beginning to cure, I wanna show a little bit of a close up here. It certainly looks pretty good. 
but I will say I can already tell at the surface it has a little bit of an orange peel look because the nap of the roller is a little bit thicker. And I'm pointing at these knot holes right here because you might have noticed in the video I was mixing up some epoxy and putting some extra in the knot holes. I wanted it to soak into any of the grooves there to make sure that doesn't become a weak spot where water or rain that sits the countertop would eventually soak into that. So we're definitely going to have to sand this um, whole thing down after it cures. Not all the way down to wood, but just make it a nice smooth surface. And then we'll apply another coat. But I'm certainly going to use a roller that is even a, a smaller nap. The one that we have here was a 3 8 nap. I'm going to get a small epoxy foam roller from a marine store. All right, so I have uh, let this dry. I've sanded it down with um, 220 grit. And I now went ahead and picked up a very, very thin foam roller. Uh, I bought mine at West Marine. I'll put a link in the description below. The 3 8 nap was just too much. It created too many air bubbles in the surface uh, that required quite a bit of sanding. So I'm hopefully, when I add this second coat, there'll be a lot less sanding on the next one. And I, I make it sound like it's a big deal with the palm sander, the electric sander, you know, it probably took 10 or 15 minutes, but I'd rather have it smoother going on. So what West Systems recommends is, I'll tell you what, let me get my epoxy and I'll tell you while I'm mixing it. So what West Systems recommends is that you take the roller, you cut it to the length, and then you cut them in thirds. I just did this in half. And you use this to slowly rub down the surface. That can also help remove any air bubbles that might get in there. It's now just a matter of applying the epoxy, much like we did the first time. The difference here is we're using this very, very thin foam roller. Uh, I won't bore you with all of this, but I went through and did the roller on the bottom, you know, four inches of each side the sides as well as the top. I then use that small cut piece of the roller to rub the whole thing down. I waited one day, took a light sanding of 220, and I applied a third coat after that. And it looks phenomenal. In the description of each part of this series, I'm gonna have time tags for all the different steps so that if you decide to make this and you want to refer back to it frequently, you can go back to YouTube, you can click in the description and just click right on the chapter you want. So for example, cutting fiberboard. If you click on that, it's gonna take you right to that section of the video. And I'll do that with every video within the series. That way you can go back and reference it. Additionally, I'm gonna put a link in the description for every one of the different um, series here, the different videos in the series, to a PDF document you can download. It has the plans, diagrams, and photos of step-by-step. -step. Uh, again, this is just me. I kind of sketch this thing out. Um, this works really well. It's good and heavy duty. If it's something you want to leverage, by all means, just go ahead and click on that link. Uh, you're going to notice it's an SV Dream Chaser site. It's our boat site, but it's a place where I could just put the PDF down there for you to download it. So you can look at it on screen or feel free to download it and use it. Um, nothing copyrighted there. Share it if you want. It's just some boneheads plans, but they work really well. <laughs> well, look, there you have it. This is the finished product. And as you can see, we've since painted the outside. I actually had the color match to the outside of our house, so it matches perfectly. Um, what I decided to do, I did do three coats of epoxy on this, and it is smooth as can be. Instead of actually attaching it down, what I've done is I actually put these, uh, epoxy these blocks of two by four right onto here. If I wanted to, I could screw these on, but I decided to leave it like this. One, gives me easy access in there if I ever need to, but this isn't going anywhere. Once this fits down on here and gets into the opening, that's good and tight right there. So, I certainly like this thing. It's easy to wipe down. It looks beautiful. You can see the color here looks good. And inside, Again, I have a good amount of storage in here, good size shelves. Keep all of our kitchen stuff right in here. And the wheels certainly make this easier. We can push this around where we need to, including what I really like, and that is when we're done with it, we just slide it right up here against the back of our house and it blends right in really pleased with this. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope if you think you could use something like this, these plans are helpful for you. Feel free to reference it as often as you want to. You can also download those plans I mentioned. Thanks everybody. Bye.